Okay, welcome everybody. Um, those who are able to join us in our live session um, and those um, reviewing this recording, um, we want to welcome you to this discussion around both the revised standard 303, um, the compliance standard for law schools, um, and the critical justice textbook uh, published by West Academic um, as an institutional framework and resource for that uh, compliance. Um, and today you're going to hear uh, from the three um, editors uh, of that book um, on how it can be used to implement a critically infused institutional response. Uh, but first, we're going to go through the standard um, and sort of step by step, line by line, and some of its complexities and its uncertainties. Um, and above all, um, though you're watching this recording, we commit to work with you um, one on one or as a faculty or as with one of your committees, because in some schools, this this task of compliance has been assigned to a curriculum or in other cases, a DEI committee um, or to individual people um, uh, in, in charged with compliance. But we'll work with um, all of you to design um, curricula um, and programs around the book. And um, we'll also be uh, willing to deliver some lectures um, in conjunction with some of the uh, suggested curriculum that we propose. So let's start with the revision and the standard itself. This is all new language, uh, um, the subpart three of, of subpart B. Um, uh, law schools need to develop a professional identity of for their law students, substantial opportunities, and also needs to provide education to law students on bias, cross-cultural competency, and racism. And then it talks about timing, um, which will also be thickened in the interpretations uh, for this standard. And also talks about timing uh, with regard to clinics or field placements, uh, otherwise known as externships. So one of the interpretations, and there's four new ones, um, talks about, well, what's meant by professional identity. It talks about values, guiding principles, and well-being practices that are considered foundational to develop a professional um, identity. And frequent opportunities for that um, during each year, so not just once and maybe again, but frequently during each um, year. Um, and then what is professional responsibility or what do those sort of professional identity mean? What do those values mean? That connects back to some pre-existing language in the standard that talks about one of the few required courses in the standards, one in professional responsibility of at least two credit hours that includes substantial instruction. There's that word substantial again in values and responsibilities of the legal profession and its members. And here a new interpretation added to say that eliminating bias, racism, discrimination in the law should be among those values of the legal professions to which students are introduced. So we've got the legal profession course, values and responsibilities. We've got the development of a professional identity and all of this is value rich, value laden, um, including um, the value and the, um, and the imperative of eliminating bias, discrimination and racism here in the law is highlighted because it's gonna read a little different in other places. There's also an interpretation that speaks directly to the new requirement around, uh, around teaching the students about bias, racism, and cultural competency. Um, and here it's talked about a variety of flexible ways that that might be done, whether it be lectures or courses or educational experiences of, a, of another sort. But the key language I think here is, is that students have to demonstrate or excuse me, law schools have to demonstrate that students participated in a substantial activity that reinforced their obligation as future lawyers to work to eliminate racism in the legal profession. Um, and reinforcement suggests that it's been introduced and reinforced time and time again. And then an interpretation, a final one added, 
3038 that talks about the standard, the ABA standard, uh, the new language doesn't dictate the exact nature of compliance. Um, but in light of the language, we suggest a number of tensions, uncertainties, complexities in achieving that compliance. And sort of the foundational one is, are we going to have as a law school, as an institution, as its faculty members um, uh, and and its law students, a minimalist response or a robust uh, response. And there are several key signals in the ABA standard, the revision, that suggest and signal robustness. Um, so you, um, we've gone through some of these, but some highlighted language around substantial activities to reinforce the obligation as future lawyers to eliminate racism in the legal profession and frequent opportunities to develop the professional identity that we saw includes values and responsibilities uh, um, and also substantial instruction in the values and responsibilities, which include eliminating um, racism and bias in the law. Um, so all of that language seems to signal robustness. Um, and Jennifer and Frank will be speaking to you um, in a few minutes as part of this webinar uh, recording are also going to are going to show specifically how the book um, contributes to that robust response. One of the questions, one of the sort of uncertainties, tensions is: is an institution, the law school, is it going to develop an institutional framework for compliance, sort of across the curriculum and across the years uh, that you're in law school, or is an individual faculty or faculty members going to be charged with grappling with compliance? in their existing or new courses or some other format? Is it just gonna be delegated and say, whatever you come up with, mention these words and, um, and, and or do whatever you want to do? Or is there some sort of buy-in institutional framework? And then how often does that training take place and when does that training take place? Just one of the many issues is we know from ABA um, guidance that was issued to deans and associate deans uh, that in fall 2022, law schools have to come up with a plan of compliance and they have to actually implement it next fall 2023. But what about for second and third years um, in the law school? Um, is it just for the entering students and Second and existing second and third years don't get any exposure. That would seem wrong, but it's not really clear. Is it all at, is it all at once? Is it all together? Um, how is that phased in, if at all? And um, and really, um, are we talking about sort of added courses and credit hours, or are we adding to what's already being taught in one L or upper division courses, or are we doing both? And what about for those students who don't undertake a clinic or field placement and instead take a simulation course? There is specified timing with regard to clinics and field placements, but not for uh, the requirement of, a, of, a, of some experiential um, component of law school that can be complied with in a simulation course. So some of the other tensions and complexities include, you know, just how racism and bias is presented. Is it presented as sort of uh, in line with with the Supreme Court's anti jurisprudence or excuse me anti discrimination um, um, principle um, and jurisprudence is just individual aberrations, um, um, bad actors, um, um, or is it really a matter of systemic failure by design? Um, and similarly, is there more to cross cultural competence than just making people feel more welcome? Um, and respected um, and not disrespected in, in lawyer communications and contact with them. So is the focus just on statements of the problem um, and histories of the problem, or um, is it richer in, um, in helping develop the knowledges, values, skills, and attitudes that the students as advocates would need for fight back and for really moving the systemic needle? And is the stated goal of all of that presentation um, and the elimination of bias and racism. Are we talking about sort of formal legal equality, which we already have in some areas or something 
that is more than promises and actually measured by outcomes and is uh, and and is laced with and measured by material and materiality and outcomes and progress. And where does diversity of the legal profession without more and however that diversity is defined fall into that dichotomy and does diversity without more eliminate racism in the legal profession. Um, and is that the aspiration that's to be taught and instructed perhaps as to how to do that or is something more needed? These are all things, by the way, that the critical justice book is as as Jennifer and Frank are going to detail. And as you're looking through the table of contents available through the West website and you're ordering a copy and and going through it and you're engaging us to help you, all of that's gonna show that the book is a resource to do the more robust approach and the thicker and deeper approach. Um, and so an additional question in line with that sort of dichotomy is, are we focusing in the instruction of the new standard around a black white paradigm, or are we talking about additional subordinations and the connections among them with a recognition that depending on context, bottom groups might ship. Um, and then, um, and this informs the entire book, what insights can be uh, in, in applying and interpreting the revised standard can be drawn from the critical schools of legal knowledge, such as critical race um, theory? Um, and really, are there any constraints and jurisdictions um, on teaching critical perspectives, particularly those from uh, that are drawn from critical race theory that that have been characterized falsely as anti-American or as divisive and in fact outlawed in, in this example from Tennessee, among others, uh, where there was a listing of divisive concepts that couldn't be taught in schools, including universities, including law schools, uh, that included things like the rule of law does not exist, but, in, but, but teaching that instead it's a series of power relationships and struggles among racial or other groups. There is an exclusion, though, at least in this law, um, for uh, compliance with any applicable academic accreditation requirement. And we think that enables uh, a robust compliance uh, with Standard 303 despite these laws. Uh, but there's something to be kept in mind uh, uh, by faculty members um, and, and in terms of an institutional framework in compliance. Additional tensions include um, the language about in the, in the, um, in the uh, standard interpretations about the obligation as future lawyers to work to eliminate racism in the legal um, profession. Does that include law schools which feed the legal uh, profession and feed the diversity um, and experience um, and culture of the legal profession to encompass the historic and present role of law schools and the ABA in partnership in a consortium to perform racial and other societal casts to engineer that, that, that non-diverse composition in the legal profession. In other words, is the ABA being self wanting, encouraging, inviting self-criticality around its role in the way things are. Um, and then additionally, since this mentions racism in the legal profession, but the standard talks about bias as well, is the problem in the legal profession solely one of racism and not bias? Um, and is bias just something outside of the legal profession? Obviously not. Um, a few additional um, things um, before I turn to Jennifer is whether uh, educated law students as lawyers can work to change the legal profession from within. You know, can systems um, that perform societal and legal casts, can they be changed from within or by otherwise privileged and rewarded participants uh, who might be co-opted, captured, or be tokens? Um, and then um, whether, uh, whether when students are being taught how law and legal actors, such as lawyers and judges, are connected to other subordinating systems, um, do they really gain a structural competence in understanding the interconnectedness of those systems um, and subsystems? These are all the things that informed our putting together of the book and drawing on rich critical knowledge and all the things that could, that could inform a robust 
institutional or individual faculty member compliance with the standard. Um, and so I've taught the book a number of times, and I found it has a number of themes and insights, and Jennifer is going to tell you about several more, that connect to robust compliance with the standard and seem to be uh, modeled around compliance with the standard. One of them is around dual consciousness and critical and the critic, what we call the critical challenge, um, which is really how do I navigate as an advocate, um, as a lawyer, the tension between knowing the law's role in perpetuating and, and, and even orchestrating um, societal caste um, and inequality, but at the same time recognizing that law is part of the solution. Um, and how do I supplement what's already taught in law school, IRAC, which everybody knows, with what we call IGIP, which is the hidden elements of identities, groups, interests, and power that can explain, that can predict the outcomes on a recurring uh, basis. And then, as we've mentioned, the rich insights from critical schools and advocacy approaches, the attention throughout the book to, to knowledges, values, skills, and attitudes um, that 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 include the relevance of bottom up knowledge and tie into building professional identity and with of most relevance to cross cultural competence what's what is collaborative professionalism that connects competence across cultures to competence across groups and borders and experts um, and more. Um, and so uh, in 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 putting the book together. Um, um, one of the three um, 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 co-editors, authors, Jennifer Hill, um, who's a former Skadden fellow, um, is, is um, going to talk about more ways in which the book um, thickens and connects to the imperatives of this standard. Jennifer? Okay, thank you. Um, and yeah, I'm going to go over sort of the book as a resource and talk about how um, the book is structured so that it does uh, address some of the tensions that Steve mentioned and and serves um, can serve as a basis for a robust response to the new standard. So first, the book takes a, a systemic approach, looks at systems, um, and that allows for greater complexity in looking at the, pro the social problems associated with racism. Um, and the skill building that needs to happen. So by taking a systemic approach, um, we look at both individual and systemic levels of, of race of a racialized system. And because uh, we're looking at the racialized systems and the way in which um, social problems affect identity groups, we can talk about the, the sort of hierarchical ordering of identity groups, but also how um, racialized identity groups are marked also by language and culture and national origin, color and other aspects, which allows for what Steve was talking about earlier, this notion of shifting bottoms. And so a more complex understanding of how does a system work um, when that system is racialized and when racism is a, a persistent problem in the system. Um, in addition, we talk, you know, there's a tendency sometimes for uh, for a traditional approach to say that law is always always helpful. It's always part of uh, a problem solving. Um, and there can be a tendency in a, from other perspectives to say that law is never helpful, that it's always hurtful. And we in the book um, sort of say to understand, to take a systems approach and understand this with complexity, you have to really see law as part of both creating problems and solving social problems, that it's both helpful and hurtful. But that if uh, students are going to learn how to use law as helpful, um, that they, uh, one of the things they need to do is to really learn bottom-up knowledge. They need to learn how to um, understand the experiences of people who have been affected negatively by law, who have been oppressed and experienced racism, as well as those who have been affected by retaliation or suppression when they try to fight back against those problems. And that that knowledge is incredibly important for problem solving, for legal problem solving. And so in the book, we expand the notion and we push students to expand the notion of what information is relevant for legal problem solving. And then finally, taking a systems approach um, allows for students to build skills um, that will allow them to 
uh, use research methods or to do research to get at that that broader set of knowledge um, that is necessary for legal problem solving in a systemic approach. So we don't talk, just talk about traditional legal research, but we also talk about things like participatory action research. Um, and we don't just talk about the need to be able to construct a good case or negotiate a good contract, but we talk about the need to use law as a tool in more complex actions like issue campaigns or community um, development projects. So in addition to looking sort of in a more, in a systems way at problems and solutions, we also look um, more deeply at the question of what this means for legal professionalism. And we re-examine legal pro professionalism and address the fact that um, collaboration is really a much more central basis of the practice of law when you're looking at trying to solve problems like racism or address issues like bias and discrimination. Um, and that collaboration happens through teams and teams are more than groups. Teams are not just groups of people, but they're actually intentionally formed functioning units that are it always cross-cultural in some ways. They, the lawyers need to be able to work across disciplinary boundaries, um, whether that's with organizers or sociologists or someone else, but they have to work across cultural boundaries that include um, cultures related to, um, related to identity, to uh, sort of race and ethnicity and national origin, class, all sorts of difference needs to be more than just recognized, it needs to be engaged. And students then also are asked to look at whether legal education and practice, whether the legal industry as a whole makes it easier or makes it harder to engage across um, cultural, in a cross-cultural way and to build really intentional teams and to collaborate on that deeper and broader level. And then we also, in several places in the book, ask students to imagine creative ways that they can work through teams to meet the obligation to address racism in the profession and in society. So this adds up to what we call structural competence, which is cross-cultural competence within the framework of a focus on systems. And this gives students something, um, several things that are, we think different and essential for, um, for addressing Systemic, um, systemic problems and also that is important as a part of a robust response to the, the standard uh, 303 mandate. The first is to say that every single lawyer is uh, it's part of their profession, it's part of their job to engage in systemic problem solving. This is not optional. It is part of the obligation of learning to be a lawyer and growing as a lawyer to try to eliminate racism in the profession and in society. So agency is something that um, is important for students uh, to feel. And then we also, um, through the book, give folks um, the cross-cultural awareness and skills and cross-cultural learning and cross-cultural engagement and teamwork that prepares them to do work in teams, but also prepares them to anticipate and manage cross-cultural cultural conflict, which is pretty, uh, which is inevitable when you're in high stress kinds of situations and trying to deal with complicated problems. So it's a, um, it's a practice, a practice approach that is helpful for students. Uh, the framework, um, the conceptual framework in the book which is a systems approach as gives students the kind of key concepts they need to explore racism, racism, but also, as Steve said, to look at racism as more than just attitudes, but to look at really the material and social consequences of racism. So to look at outcomes um, as, um, as an essential, uh, essential measurement of how systems are operating and how racism is um, affecting real people in the real world. And finally, we we offer many, many opportunities for reflection in the book and many different options so that students can think about what does it mean to build a successful legal practice when you take into account the mandates of standard 303 and how, what are the choices? What are the values? What are the um, types of uh, critical and self-critical reflection that are important to have the kind of growth that students need as lawyers? So finally, what we hope is that students coming out of um, working with these materials 
uh, develop this structural competence. And with structural competence, they are much, much better prepared to both diagnose social problems and strategize solutions to social problems that will, uh, or in a way that will help them to address and even eliminate uh, racism within the profession and in society as standard 303 mandates. Also, um, the the sort of reflective parts and the uh, the professionalism, uh, the deeper notion of collaboration and professional professionalism helps students become more intentional as stewards that are looking to improve law as a system and looking to um, measure its improvement by changed outcomes in real people's lives in, in the world. And sort of in a more uh, pragmatic vein, um, the book is available, as Steve said, the table of contents is available on the West website. You can order a sample copy and review the book. We're working to develop and we have developed these flexible packets that enable you to um, tailor pieces of the book that best fit your school's needs and can provide support to help you do that. And within these packets, what what we are hoping that you will find is a all-in-one material packets, which means the sort of foundational concepts that people need for analysis, some um, that is tied to substantive issues. And we're not going to go over every bit of substantive issue, but there's reproductive justice is covered, you know, um, uh, policing, ra uh, race, racialized policing is covered, crimmigration is covered, many, many issues that come up um, over and over again in society and in different classes are covered in the book, as well as advocacy applications um, and uh, practical problems and professional identity formation. All the proceeds from the book go to an academic nonprofit, and, um, and we're uh, sort of ready to help you use the materials um, as you engage in what we hope is robust implementation of Standard 303. And that's what Frank is now going to talk about. Thank you, Steve and Jennifer, and thank you, everyone, um, for joining us uh, for this discussion of this very timely issue in uh, two ways, timely in two ways. Um, the enactment of revised standard 303 provides a truly timely and unique opportunity to act upon truly extraordinary times. And so when we contemplate whether to respond robustly or minimally, I hope that we recall and recall for our colleagues and our schools, the times in which we are living and how 303 and robust compliance allows us uh, to respond to those times in a timely way using uh, the skills and the resources and the positions that we already have. So with those uh, background thoughts in mind, it, it's worthwhile to begin by recalling and emphasizing that as Steve mentioned at the outset, revised standard 303 is not an end unto itself. The kinds of instruction and capacitation that it mandates are means to an end. That end, as we saw in the interpretation of the ABA 303.7, is focused on fulfilling the obligation, to use their word, to eliminate, to use their word, racism and bias in the profession, and by extension, I would say, society. So the ABA uh, standard provides a flexible means to a constant end that requires a proactive and professional emphasis. And as Jennifer outlined, so does the critical justice textbook. It provides a flexible, action-oriented set of materials that are very comprehensive and yet very shuffable, very adaptable for adoption and use in different circumstances, including revised standard 303 
and the kinds, the four kinds of compliance suggestions that interpretation 303.7 spells out. So even though the standard does not attempt to dictate precisely how compliance can be achieved, it does lay out a framework of possibilities. And we use that same framework to structure the institutional compliance framework, as we are calling it, that we present today and in the following slides. So please observe that as we go through this, the various offerings, the, the menu of offerings, are, are focused not only on describing problems, but on using knowledge of problems in order to capacitate students for problem solving. So it's education for problem solving. It's education to fulfill the obligation to end racism in the profession. So with those thoughts and that emphasis, the first slide that we're looking at now additionally shows that the menu we have provided also tracks not only the suggestions of the ABA standard, but the pre-existing structure of the law school curriculum. So all of these offerings are presented in a way that uh, makes them very easy to insert seamlessly into your existing curricular structure and offerings according to the circumstances or priorities of your school vis-a-vis -vis 303 specifically. So you'll see that first and responding to the way that 303 is structured, we offer a menu of orientation, workshop, and talking circles in the fall during the 1L year, followed by a 1L, two credit, or a three credit course during the spring semester, again, of that first year. We'll get to that in more detail in a moment, but just take in the framework as a framework. Additionally, this framework responds to 303's specification that part of this instruction should be offered in the context of clinical education. And so we've included in this framework a one credit add-on course that functions as a capstone to the readings and the offerings that a particular school may have selected from the previous offerings that we outlined for the 1L year. And for those teachers in a school where there is no robust compliance, because that may happen, we also include in this framework a one credit add-on course that functions as a standalone offering that different kinds of clinics covering different types of topic areas can adopt and adapt. This last uh, offering, the standalone clinical offering, we developed with other, well, not with other, with clinical uh, faculty at Cornell, Pitt, and other places. So it's a collaborative effort. Um, the materials, as you will see and have already seen, begin by introducing students to the basics, um, situating law vis-a-vis -vis justice, and focusing on the kinds of skills that would be necessary to conduct oneself differently in professional settings, and builds from there, uh, from those foundations, uh, with the the orientation sessions and the talking circles that are described in these uh, slides. So you see that we provide two different sessions for the orientation workshops. A school can offer to do one or both. A school can offer to do part of session A or do part of session B or mix parts from either or both. 
notice that we give you the page numbers so that you can make uh, assessments that are practical in relationship to time and the structuring of your orientation program as a whole. And we can help you further trim or further focus these offerings, this menu, so that you can um, customize them specifically for your, uh, for your situation at your school. We also have, in addition to the fall semester uh, orientation sessions at the beginning of the semester, follow-up talking circles, three of them, so that they can occur monthly during the remainder of the fall, that cover the themes that you see on the slide, followed again by page numbers so that you can further trim and customize. You will see again how these uh, themes build uh, or rather establish foundations in order to then build on the foundations towards uh, hands-on action-oriented uh, problem solving. And again, as with the uh, orientation sessions, schools can offer one talking circle, two talking circles, all three talking circles can trim the pages offered to be uh, less than what we offer. Again, everything is customizable and designed to be easily so, given the structure of a typical law school curriculum already. The uh, second semester of the 1L year, uh, uh, schools can follow up on what we just covered in the second semester with either a two credit seminar or a three credit course that as the slide shows you, can be assembled from the materials that we've already uh, covered plus some new materials that we will look at in a moment, depending on whether the two credit or the three credit option is better for your school. In other words, these packet, the, these offerings that we've just touched on cover an entire year and you can offer some parts in the fall, some parts in the spring, and within the fall and the spring, you can further customize, you can further um, uh, tailor to your circumstances. So that's the 1L year. And in the second semester, you see here a little bit more detail on the kinds of themes, as well as the pages, the page counts um, for each class session that would cover a semester. Again, the page number being trimmable, depending on whether a school opts for a two credit seminar or a three credit course. But otherwise, again, designed to fit into the pre-existing structure of a law school semester and thus culminate the second semester of the first year in a way that really establishes in a robust way the foundations that the revised uh, standard and its authoritative interpretations seem fairly clearly to call for. In addition to these 1L uh, offerings that again are shuffable and customizable, we offer, as I mentioned at the outset, two upper level courses that are focused on clinical education to satisfy that second component of the revised 303 mandate. The first functions as a capstone by which we mean its readings are selected deliberately to build on the kinds of offerings that schools would have uh, drawn from and modified to their own purposes uh, before a student gets to a clinical placement. And here you see, as you saw previously, the sessions and the themes with the page counts for those uh, sessions that again cover the span of a semester and allow teachers or schools to mix and match, to make selections, uh, both uh, 
with respect to the themes and the sessions, and then within each with respect to the page counts or the particular points actually highlighted uh, in, the, in the decisions being made. So that's the template for the capstone. In addition, we have a template for the standalone course. That is, as I mentioned earlier, for teachers that are not in a school where the 1L offerings are being adopted in response to 303, and therefore the readings necessarily can't build on those previous offerings and have to start from the get-go, which is what this standalone template does. And you can see again, the very, uh, very simple um, themes for the standalone course that uh, we also have the details for and we'll provide you with along with this recording and other resources. But again, you can see from the themes and the structuring of the syllabus that uh, the course is designed to fit seamlessly into the pre-existing structure of a typical law school semester. These are some small, uh, or these not small, but these are additional practical points that go along with the readings just outlined in the standalone course that we can discuss in more detail with you, but are typical of, of a clinical placement in law school today. So far, we have covered the principal uh, three suggestions that are relatively specific, spelled out in Revised Standard 303 and Interpretation 303.7, that is orientation sessions, lectures, and courses. However, the, author the interpretation also lists as a fourth category, other. And other uh, can mean, well, many kinds of things. We offer here a couple of suggestions. Uh, teachers uh, in whatever substantive area can, with our assistance, if you like, shuffle the sections, the readings, the materials provided in the book in order to create packets or modules that can be added on to pre-existing courses, for instance, here in con law courses. And again, we have more detail about the sections and the page counts, but you can see how uh, the modules are themed in order to fit into various points or subject areas that necessarily come up in a constitutional law course. And so this is one way that individual teachers, even if not a clinical teacher, can make up in an individual way for the lack of an institutional compliance framework, or if there is an institutional compliance framework to help reinforce it in the way that the ABA standard calls for. And finally, in this vein, we have a second example of the way in which teachers can shuffle or cobble or uh, cluster together various sections of the book to create a module or a packet that can be fitted seamlessly into a, uh, a mainstream or core course already in the law school curriculum. Here, you see the example for professional responsibility courses. And again, in effect, four modules four points in which a teacher can choose to interject these materials throughout the course of the semester, whether it's just one or two or three of the four or all four. And again, within each, you see the page counts 
and how the page counts can either be used as is or trimmed further in order, again, to suit the specific purposes and circumstances of the teacher. So with those examples, um, we hope that you will uh, order a copy of the book, take some time to visit the West website and uh, really take in the table of contents that spells out all these sections and their substantive principal points so that you can see how you can shuffle them in ways that we haven't shown here perhaps, but that are uh, completely original and customized to you. And if you want our help to do that, here is the way to reach us. Please do so. We welcome your feedback and we welcome any opportunity to help you follow up robustly. Thank you.